Hey, welcome to the One Piece of the Time Distilling Institute with your host, the alchemist of Indiana's Black Forest, Alan Bishop. Hey, this channel is all about home distilling and legal distilling. If you've got questions, reach out to us in the comments below, social media, or via bishopshomegrown at gmail.com. And don't forget to check out thealchemistcabinet.com. Hey guys, back yet again with another talking head video. Of course, there's going to be a lot of these. That's what this channel is going to focus on now as much as anything is providing good, solid information in a spoken word format, uh, answering your questions about the art of distillation, whether it's on a home scale or on a craft distilling scale, uh, with the goal of eventually maybe we can get this whole home distilling thing legalized for all of you guys out there that are doing the home distilling thing, because it should be. It is completely unconstitutional, in my opinion, that you can't make your own liquor at home, but you can make your own wine or beer at home probably has a whole lot more to do with taxation than it does safety if you want to know the ultimate truth of the whole thing um, especially in a world where walmart.com and home depot.com and lowes.com sell stills at this point uh, the gears in the world have shifted they have changed since i got into this when i was uh, 15 years old and you had to build everything you could out of whatever junk you could get a hold of or you had to use you know had to be a good copper builder one way shape form or the other so all that being said, if you guys have questions, reach out to me, bishopshomegrown at gmail.com, thealchemistcabinet.com, where you can pick up the brand new uh, Practical Distillers Almanac, much like a farmer's almanac, but headed towards distillers. And that's something we're going to be doing every single year now. Um, reach out to me as well in the YouTube comments below or via social media. And as I have time and the ability, I will do my best to answer those questions. And not that I know everything in the world, because there are certainly times that I don't. And you guys certainly send some damn good questions sometimes. So... Uh, here we go from Doug. Hey, Alan, uh, thanks for sharing your knowledge with all of us novices. My question is about how fermentation temperature affects flavor of the resulting product. I recently was able to attend a tasting event where Todd Leopold spoke about his process. If I understood him correctly, he was recommending fermenting at a lower temperature than I have heard people are using. If I remember, he was fermenting at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, where most of the things I've read recommend 90 degrees Fahrenheit. He was counting on the lower ferment to add more flavor over a longer time. Can you comment on your experience of lower temps and longer fermentation times as compared to 9 degrees Fahrenheit and 3 to 5 days as I've read on many forums? Yeah, I think I can contribute to this, and there's there's a lot to it. So, um, you know, the basic sort of rule of thumb for my distillery is, you know, if we're fermenting brandies, 65 to 68 degrees is where we want to be. We want to hold on to all of that possible volatility that we can possibly hold on to in any way, shape, or form. Right, that volatility is flavor, and we want to be able to still taste some apple or pick up some sensory uh, of the apple when we make our apple brandy that has been aged for four, six, eight years, etc. Right? If we don't hold on to that volatility throughout the processing of the fruit, throughout the fermentation itself, and throughout the two distillation phases, stripping and doubling, then we're not going to have that apple aroma and that apple flavor in a way that we would hope to at the end of the distillation. And certainly it's not going, what little is there is not going to survive the barrel. So yes, temperature becomes very important. Now with whiskey, it's a little more versatile. And what I mean by that is, well, my general rule for most of our yeast strains is 85 degrees for three to four days, sometimes five days. <clears throat> it's not as hard to hold on to the volatility of whiskey those compounds are not nearly as volatile as what they are in brandy and you can certainly take them down to low temperature especially if you're using the right kind of yeast and one thing that i realize about the home distilling and the commercial community is how very rarely that a distiller will use a winemaker's yeast to make a whiskey with if you want to really hold on to the volatility of that grain it's a great way to do it throw throw a winemaking yeast or a brandy yeast in there drop your temperature and drop your pH to a relative level as to what a wine must would be and you'll really get some pretty amazing volatiles out of it and Todd is great at that sort of stuff that's exactly his style of distillation um, and there's nothing at all wrong with that um, on the other hand it also depends on where your flavor is coming from right so if the flavor is really mostly coming from the grain then that's that's a great way to do it or the 85 degrees for three to four days works completely fine for us on pot still we get all kinds of grain flavor out of that without any problems without having to go to any lower temperature etc and some of those volatiles we don't want that's why i've talked about before my speed of distillation with rye whiskey or high rye bourbon in particular is much faster and my 
Uh, I'm also running my condenser a little warmer because I'm wanting to off gas some of those things that I actually don't want on that rye whiskey or that high rye bourbon. Some of those more medicinal, uh, Robitussin like black cherry sort of characteristics. Some of those more, um, uh, what's where dill sort of characteristics you can sometimes get off rye. I want those off there. And if I were to ferment cold, I'd have that much more of that stuff that I didn't want. Now, the other side of it with whiskey that I do as well is I oftentimes ferment very hot and very fast. Um, if I'm using, for example, Kvike, Kvike yeast is an old, you know, there's multiple varieties of it. Old Scandinavian farmhouse yeast is what they are. You know, they were run in sane houses, so malting houses with furnaces. Uh, typically, you were brewing your beer in that malting house right next to the furnace, and a lot of times the temperature of that beer was getting up to 102, 100, 300, 405. Those Kvike strains are great at throwing these crazy, crazy off flavors, but those crazy off flavors just happen to be very fruity. And so therefore, those fruity volatiles that I'm getting into that whiskey where I'm using Kvike are not coming from a low temperature wine yeast. They're coming from a high temperature beer yeast, and they're not coming from the grain itself. They're coming specifically from the yeast variety itself. And I'm talking aromas and flavors like strawberry and guava and sometimes like fried plantain sort of characteristics. Sometimes a little bit of like uh, Madagascar vanilla comes through. Um, but that's at a high temperature, right? So where Todd might drop to a 68, 67 degrees, I might, on the other hand, go to 105 degrees for one of my mixed Kvike strains that I've worked on for a few years now. Um, we're both after flavor. We're just after different kinds of flavor. Or even if they are similar flavors, we're going about two different methods to get those same sort of flavors. Um, typically for almost everything, like I said, my, uh, my typical fermentations are 85, 90 degrees for three to four days on whiskey. Uh, but I do tend to use two different yeast strains. And again, for the same reason. So day one, I'm actually using the equivalent of Fleischmann's bread yeast that we propagated ourselves over a number of years. It's no longer straight up Fleischmann's. It's for sure mutated to some degree and that's okay. It pulls that grain way to the forefront. Day two, I'm actually using one of three different brandy yeast varieties. And even though those are recommended at 68 degrees, I'm still running those at 85, 90 degrees, and I'm still getting wonderful fruity aromas, specifically things like banana nut bread, um, sometimes a little hazelnut. Uh, we also have this really cool thing that we have happen with the Fleischmann yeast in particular, where a lot of our whiskeys will end up with a little bit of sort of whorehound candy sort of characteristic, which has become a little bit of a house style for us. So um, hopefully that sort of sort of clears that up for you, but, but play around with all those things and see the different directions you can go because you'd really, really be surprised uh, how much you can change the flavor just by fermentation temperature, different yeast strains, um, and things of that nature. So, um, let's see. I think I got time for one more for this video. So let's see what we got here. Hey again, Alan and Kim and everyone watching One Piece at a Time. My gin keeps fighting back. When I make vodka, whiskey, or rum, I have no trouble cutting the proof down to 40% without any kind of louching. I built a little dripper rig that adds the water super slowly over the course of about 24 hours. But damn, if I try to take my gins below 50%, I can pretty much guarantee that will cloud up like that one day a year. You get to go to the beach no matter how slowly I proof down. I do make a fairly citrus rich style that in that I add peel both to my maceration and the boiler when doing the final distillation. I also put all the macerated botanicals in a linen bag and throw them into a boiler. And maybe I do run down into the tail some as I really like a bit of the darker, raunchier flavors this gives me. It makes a nice contrast to the bright citrus notes. Any ideas? Should I cut back on total botanicals, ease up on tails, or just leave it at rocket fuel strength and ice proof when mixing? Uh, stay happy and healthy. It's a great question and one that I've answered many times in person or during consultation for many other distillers. <laughs> Certainly, <clears throat> the more botanicals you use and the more oily those botanicals, the worse this issue becomes. One thing I will tell you is that don't even try to proof it down like that over 24 hours. You're going to have to take longer than that. You really need to be proofing that gin down over the course of a couple of weeks. I know it sucks. I know it takes time, but it's the only way to prevent that luching and saponification. Secondarily, yeah, you're probably diving too far into your tails. That's a big problem I see with a lot of gin producers. And although it is grungy and it's funky, <clears throat> I'll tell you a secret. You can get the exact same effect by saving your tails at the proper cut and adding them to your next run of gin. Nobody else out there is going to tell you that because everybody out there is paralyzed by conjecture. And they'll say, well, nobody adds tails back to their gin before they redistill. Yeah. Several of us actually do. We just don't tell anybody because that's kind of a 
amongst distillers a, a trade guild secret sort of thing. Uh, but if you want that grunginess, add, save those tails. Cut it at the proper place from hearts to tails. Save those tails and put those in the next run. You'll find out that you, you've you got just as much grunginess there. But you got to really spend your time proofing that down slowly over several, several days or you're going to get that loosh every time. The citrus oils will cause a little bit of a loose from time to time, but usually not all that bad. I will tell you any amount of anise whatsoever or any amount of licorice root whatsoever. Um, sometimes angelica root will have the same effect. Those will loose like crazy. Now, I still use them and proof down and I don't know. Um, so you said below 50%. That's pretty normal. Um, I typically try to proof my gins to about 92 to 94 percent is where I'm is where I'm headed or 90 I'm sorry 92 to 94 proof is where I'm headed as opposed to 100 proof um, and it does take a little while right you have to take your time with it the other thing is make sure that you're stirring that vigorously if you've got some kind of air pump or something like that where you can get some air in there as you're proofing that will help you a whole lot because otherwise what happens is those oils all come out of suspension at different levels. And so across whatever your container is, you're going to have different levels of different oils uh, that are just sitting there and saponifying or louching. So if you keep it aerated, all that stuff stays uh, more homogeneous or yeah, homogeneous. Uh, you know, it's not separating out into its individual constituents to, uh, to cause you problems in the future. So, um, I know that kind of sucks. It's just sometimes there's no other better way to do it. Um, and certainly much better to have a nice clear gin to drink than to have a cloudy gin that people go, what the hell's going on with that? So anyways, I hope that answers y'all's questions and, uh, we will catch up again soon. Support us at thealchemistcabinet.com. Buy the books, buy the practical distillers on that. Check out the, if you have ghosts, you have everything podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. And in fact, there's a new episode getting ready to go up on the YouTube channel now. As you've noticed, we've been doing a few videos here and there. Uh, for if you have ghosts and about to add another one. Love y'all. Later.